So these are some of the reasons why I've seen that we need lean portfolio management. Project, using projects to manage Agile is just not the right model. And it's not a knock on the discipline of project management. It's just that that was, that was developed for a time when things moved much slower and it didn't require the fast feedback and cycles that we have today. And it assumed a lot of things that were done up front would hold true for, you know, later on. So that same thinking when we're still using projects permeates into the work that our teams do. So, you know, annual planning, we won't get away from it, but how can we make it more agile? How can we get away from project cost accounting and having teams which get together and disband? We wanna have stable teams. Even with agile, we're still having an overload of demand versus capacity. And it often seems that our senior leaders are disconnected with what's happening on the trains. So they keep pushing down work. If you're doing just Scrum or Kanban, a lot of too much work is being pushed down to the teams. A lot of Agile teams are still using phase gate approval processes. And that causes you to work in a sequential way even though you might be working in sprints and doing daily meetings and all the ceremonies of Scrum or Kanban, if you still have phase gates, that by its nature is gonna cause you to work in a very sequential way because we gotta get sign off on various aspects of the project. Uh, I say that I'm one of the greatest science fiction writers of all time. And the reason why I say that is because I have created many, many, many business cases in my lifetime. And it was some of the greatest fiction ever. When I look back and see, you know, I could get anything approved through the CFO. All I had to do was to create a spreadsheet, you know, with net present value, a, a five year cash flow. And it looks, looks good. Yeah. Okay. Let's sign off on this. But the assumptions were never questioned. And we all know that it's the assumptions the, that are really important and that we prove those assumptions before we just you know, make our bets at the casino, so to speak, and place big bets on things that we don't even know if our customers want them, but we're still working that way. The other thing that we're still doing is we're still measuring outputs versus okay. business outcomes. It doesn't matter how many stories we've written or coded, or how many features have been implemented. It's about are we actually getting the business outcomes that we want to get? And unfortunately, it's always difficult to measure value. Because value is in the, value like beauty is in the eye of the, the beholder. The only person that can say what value is, is your customer. And customers are, even, even a customer segment, isn't necessarily homogenous. Everyone has a different understanding of what um, value is. The other thing that I often see from a strategy perspective is companies say, we want to be the number one car rental company. We want to be, have the best car in the world. We want to have the best phone. But there is no such thing as the best because every customer is different. Different customer segments are much different. And so there is no best. Those are not strategy statements. Those are goals. So most of the time what I'm finding out is most of our senior leaders really confuse strategy and tactics and other things as well. And I'll give you a link to a good video later on that you can watch on strategy itself. So here are some of the shifts that we want to do from a traditional approach to a lean agile approach. When we are even doing agile, many people are still in functional silos and a project is a temporary team that is doing temporary work. And when that work is done, 
the project team disbands and they move on to something else. Funding projects takes a lot of cooperation between different functional managers to quote, lend you their people for a certain amount of time and a certain percentage of their time, which leads us to think about utilization, resource utilization. People are not resources, so I don't like that in any case. But to have a certain resource utilization and that utilization mindset is more focused on how much of, of people's time we're using than are we getting the are we getting value from their time? So are we getting the outcomes from their time? So we need to focus more on outcome and throughput. Throughput is much more important than resource utilization. I've never seen any software developer sitting around because they had nothing to do. So resource utilization should not be in the equation. And we all know that we still do big upfront, top-down annual planning. I've been a CIO and I can tell you one of the things I had to do every year was to come up with a list of all the projects that we're going to work on, figure out how much of each role that we need to carry out those projects to justify the existing staff that I had and perhaps to justify additional staff and ask you to and guess what would happen? Is that people planned in, in June or, or July of the year, and then uh, everything would get changed the other year. So uh, based on just the sounds we just heard, basically our plans were basically flushed down the toilet. <laughs> and you know, we, all that planning we did was, was really worthless. You know, the speculative business cases that I just mentioned, and again, the, the phases of uh, phase gates is really, they, they really remove the agility. So in the framework, you see here the portfolio level of SAFE. And you'll notice that on the left there are these two circles, and those represent competencies. So the portfolio level has two main competencies, lean portfolio management, and organizational agility. And we'll mainly be covering lean portfolio management. So you can become very familiar with what's at the portfolio level by starting with the competency article on the left and then reading from left to right about the other articles on the framework. So now that we know and we're oriented where we are, let's talk about what lean portfolio management is. So it is one of those seven core competencies that we have in the framework. And it's all about aligning strategy with execution. And we want to be using lean and agile and system thinking approaches to three important areas. Strategy, investment funding, our portfolio operations, and our governance. And this is a model of lean portfolio management in SAFE. And what it's showing is we have these three different collaborations that are required for Lean, por lean portfolio management, those three areas that I just mentioned. And you'll notice that for strategy investment funding, you'll see a, a bunch of minimum roles here. And the roles for strategy investment funding might be slightly different than what we would use in actual portfolio operations and then what we'll use at lean governance. So each of these has a set of minimal roles and you will find you're gonna need more roles than just the ones that we're defining here but we don't want to overthink this for you because every organization is going to have different names for these roles. And so, so you know, we just put the minimum there. So what is a portfolio in SAFE? A portfolio is a development value stream. And a development value stream builds solutions. They build software, they build systems, and they also maintain the products services and solutions that they create. And solutions are delivered to our customer, whether they're internal or external. And typically what you want to do in a portfolio is you want to have like things together. So I'm sure a lot of you have a, uh, have stocks or 401k plan at the very least. And what a portfolio helps you do is see a collection of things together to understanding how that collection of things is performing. 
So back to the stock analogy, imagine that you might have some stocks in the tech sector. You might have some top stocks in the pharmaceutical sector. By placing each of those in a different portfolio, we can see how each of those portfolios are performing and what we may need to do to make adjustments. It's the same thing with our solution portfolios. If we're in banking, we may have a portfolio for our consumer loan products and services. We might have a different portfolio for our consumer lending application. So we wanna figure out what are the solutions that belong together in the collection so that we can reason about those solutions and what we need to do to those solutions as a whole so that when we combine the capabilities of those solutions in the portfolio, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And by the way, feel free to ask questions or interrupt me anytime during this presentation, if that's okay with you, Mark. Definitely. Okay, okay great. So we'll make, I wanna make this interactive. So one of the things that um, is important to note is that you know, if you're in a very large company, typically there will be one portfolio often for a different line of business. So again, if we go back to banking, you might have a portfolio for uh, you know, investments, you might have a portfolio for loans, uh, wealth management, and so on. If you're in a small organization like mine, I work you know, at Scaled Agile, we have about 150 employees. And so we don't need multiple portfolios and we run the entire business on safe and we only have one agile release train, a rather large one that will probably be splitting soon. And so that we only need one portfolio and always start out with the simplest possible thing that can work and then see if you need multiple portfolios from there. And yeah, Richard. Well, yes. Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, uh, what is what is the definition for you uh, or for safe of a value stream? Yeah, so a, a value stream is simply anywhere a, you, you find a product or service, you're going to find a value stream. And a value stream contains the people who do the work, and it also contains the series of steps to go from to, to for that particular processes that are evolving. So in the development value stream, right, we're, we're defining, we're building, we're testing, uh, we're, and there's probably other processes involved in you know, creating solutions and maintaining those solutions. So that's the steps in the development value stream. In an operational value stream or a business, or you can think of it as a business value stream, it's a series of steps to carry out um, value for our customers. So if, if we go back to the banking, let's say you have, you have a loan origination value stream. And there's going to be a series of steps that you go through to provide a loan. You're going to attract customers. You're going to, they're going to apply for the loan. You're going to, you're going to do a credit score on them. You're going to either approve or disapprove the loan. And then finally, hopefully you'll be able to grant them that loan and then start receiving money from the customer and, get, and getting interest on the money that you're lending them. So those steps and the people who work on those steps, that's what constitutes a value stream. And value stream thinking came from manufacturing. And they use value stream thinking to manage the flow of work as things were being manufactured. Now, manufacturing is much different than software development because manufacturing is a well defined process. So we've adapted value streams thinking over the years to apply to systems and software development. And there's a lot of good things that we can have from a value stream, such as if we understand a series of steps that it takes us to enhance solutions or develop solutions, we can then look at, well, what steps do we have delays? What steps are taking a really amount of time? Where can we eliminate some of the handoffs? So having this thinking of a value stream helps us in a couple of ways. First of all, we're organized around that value. And typically a development value stream is, is organized to um, 
develop solutions for one or more operational value streams, the people who actually do the work and um, help customers through that loan, as an example, while the developers are developing the solutions for people to apply for that loan. Sorry, Richard, uh, I think Hannah was saying that um, ITIL also emphasize the importance of value stream. So Hannah, if you wanna speak about it, but I think the main concept, Richard, is value stream is not something SAFE is coming up with. It's, it's something that, that already exists. Yes. Hannah, do you wanna go ahead and? Yeah, so ITIL is, um, is um, so especially the new version of ITIL is IT is for is IT service uh, IT infrastructure library, and uh, it's more about the service management. And they have uh, they have defined in the new version version for about the uh, value stream system and the value stream chain. So the value stream system has in it the value stream chain, which has all these components of um, uh, engage, build and transition support and, uh, and, um, and uh, releasing, etc. And the value system, uh, value uh, stream system, it has governance, it has guiding principles, it has the uh, value stream uh, chain, it has the, um, uh, the uh, processes and, and, uh, and uh, processes and values, uh, processes and something else. It, it's very similar to what's in ITIL. I mean, because, you know, whether you're doing ITSM or you're doing software development, there's, you know, a process that you have. You have people who are involved in that process and you want to be able to understand how long it takes to get through that process, which is known as the lead time from the work arrives to when the work is actually available, you know, to people so that, you know, in software, you know, the, the process ends when we've delivered the software in production and, and customers can start using those solutions. So it's very similar thinking, Hannah. Thank you for sharing that. How would you use the value stream in the portfolio management? Well, we're going to go through that as, as we're doing here. So we're going to first provide some background and we'll, we'll explain how value streams are, are being used. And, and I'm, I'm about to do that right now. So in today's world, most organizations look like on the left, even if you're doing agile, you have all these different functional silos. You have various business groups, sales, marketing, uh, finance, et cetera. You have product management. You might, you might have people who develop hardware, people who develop software, testing, compliance, security, and so on. And when you are, when you have silos, and you have silos when you're doing agile development as well, if you're not organized around value. So if we have our developers organized around value, that means that we have all the people that we need to deliver functionality end to end. So we can do define, we can build, we can test, we can implement, we can deploy, we can release. We can do all of that as well as have the business people that we need on our train to do the marketing of that solution, to do the finance work on that solution, et cetera. So we, by organizing the people that we need to develop these solutions end to end, we save a lot of handoffs and delays. So that's the biggest aspect of value streams in SAFE is that we're trying to eliminate the handoffs and delays and then organize people around the products and services that we sell. And we're organized around products and services instead of projects, a big change happens. Our mindsets are now focused on delivering value. When we are organized in projects, whether it's agile or not, our goal is to complete tasks. So our focus is on task completion and when, no matter what, what happens is when, you, when you're working in the project paradigm with these tasks, people tend to focus on completing their work and not really worrying about their teammates or worrying about the, a team of agile teams, which is what we call an agile release train in SAFE. Now that's a broad statement. It doesn't mean that every organization is like that, but that system tends to have people focused on tasks instead of creating value where 
in SAFE and other agile methods, we are more focused on creating value. So one of the things that we need to understand is that we want to be able to align what a portfolio does with the enterprise strategy. And what you're seeing on this slide here is an enterprise strategy formulation um, that we learned from Jim Collins in Beyond Entrepreneurship. And it's one of the better models that discusses how to develop an enterprise strategy. Yes, there was a question? Yeah, the, sorry, I, I, I would come back to a uh, value stream and uh, I have some uh, question about some for implementation perspective. Uh, so for our organization, so now we are, we are in the phase or it, to implement portfolio level and we have a lot of uh, challenges to define what should be the portfolio and we have a lot of law, more than 20 arts so far running, but the challenges is to define this portfolio level and what should, which value stream should be in the same portfolio since we have a huge company and we have a big solution. So in this case, so we are organizing our value stream around some pipelines and each pipeline is a set of asset, so a lot of applications, and we try to group this application by to deliver value uh, in the same pipeline. It is not really uh, like safe asking, but it is only the way uh, we are seeing so far to group uh, this value stream around a, a set of, of uh, assets and set of applications. So uh, is, what do you think about that? So, uh, so uh, and they can give you example uh, like, yeah. like 5G. So 5G is a big, big, big product for us. Uh -huh. And you have more than 3000 people who can work to deliver this 5G. And this 5G, we have more than three or five uh, 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 business unit who should work on at each business unit we have one or more than uh, portfolio managers uh, and from uh, from safe perspective it is more than one portfolio they have and yeah. have this big solution it is the solution it is not solution it, is, it should be that a portfolio should be a large solution should be what? <laughs> uh, so, what do you think about this? Uh, so, this Ali, issue? I think I think just in in the in in the sake of public, we can take that maybe after the session. Richard can can stay for a few minutes and give you his advice. But let's keep it just general for everyone there. So, I don't know, Richard, if you agree on that. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes sense because it sounds like a very specific case to your company. Yes, it's a complicated and uh, okay. so, so that's why it's from implementation perspective. Sure, yeah. sure. I, I, I get it and, and I'm going to stay behind and yeah. answer the question. We can, yeah, we can discuss it with Richard maybe separately so we can stay after that. Sorry for everyone. Okay, so, no problem. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Ali. So for I was you. thinking about we need to understand what our enterprise strategy is. So when you implement lean portfolio management, it's important to understand what is the vision and mission and the core values of your enterprise. What is its distinctive competence? Meaning, what does your organization do better than anyone else? So back to the car example, there is no best car. Now, if you really want a fast sports car, you may get a Tesla. However, if you're looking for luxury and comfort, you might be looking at a Lexus. So that's why we need to understand what is our strengths. Ikea, the furniture store, their distinctive competence is building low cost, good quality furniture that could be shipped in flat boxes any place in the world. So that's a, a competence that they have and they're able to reduce the cost of manufacturing and shipping their furniture so it's available at a lower price. 
So it's important to understand the, the distinctive, distinctive competence of your organization, as well as the distinctive competence in your portfolio. Out of the enterprise strategy, a couple things should come out of it. it is the budget for each portfolio. And most of us here will have multiple portfolios in our case. And also the strategic themes. These are the differentiating business objectives. And I'm gonna go into that a little deeper in a few minutes. And then we also wanna have feedback from the portfolio to the enterprise so that we may decide to potentially even increase a, the budget of a particular portfolio or shift some funding. Uh, so we need to provide some data back to the enterprise such as KPIs and uh, qualitative data and quantitative and other quantitative data uh, as well as how we're doing against our lean budget guardrails, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. So now, once we understand our enterprise strategy, we want to understand is how does our particular portfolio connect with the enterprise? We want to understand what is our contribution from our portfolio to the enterprise. It's important that we know that so that we're not duplicating what some other portfolio is doing and that people can be connected with mission and purpose. So these are the five areas of strategy investment funding, connecting the portfolio to enterprise strategy. And I'll talk about that next using strategic themes, creating and maintaining a portfolio vision. And we wanna implement that vision through the use of EPICS, large initiatives. We'll also use features too, but lean portfolio management isn't concerned with features. They're concerned with the larger investments, which are EPICS. And then if we're gonna do decentralized decision-making and decentralized execution, and we're giving a value stream a certain amount of budget and letting them run you know, fairly autonomously, we need to have some guardrails to ensure that they are staying in alignment because alignment is not a natural state. You need to bring people back into alignment and the guardrails help ensure that the portfolio stays aligned on the mission and vision. So this is the strategic themes that I was talking about and what they represent are business objectives that, that take us from the current state to a better future state. And so here's a couple of examples of good and bad strategic themes. I'll start with the bad ones first. Increase shareholder wealth. Maximize corporate value. Who can tell me what's, what's wrong with those strategic themes? Hasn't every company you've ever been with had those strategic themes? So how can they be wrong? Can anyone tell it's me? Broad. It's very broad. That's what I think at least, Richard. Like, you know, increasing shareholder wealth. I mean, like by what? Maybe 20%, 10%, something, something specificity. Right. Even at 10 or 20%, that doesn't really help us much, does it? Because it doesn't tell us how we're going to get there. And strategy is about, you know, our, our plan of action to get someplace. Now, let's look at some good examples of strategic themes. Let's say that you're a video streaming service and perhaps your CBS uh, television streaming service. And that they typically appeal to, uh, you know, say 31 to 49. And so they skew much higher. If they want, and then a good, you know, uh, objective for them could be to appeal to a younger demographic, the coveted 18 to 29 demographic. Uh, if you're Amazon, you want to continue to reduce your warehousing cost so that you can offer affordable products with or without shipping cost. And so that it differentiates from where you are today. That's the important thing of strategic themes. Now, although those are good strategic themes, we still don't know exactly quite what makes that up. So we recently introduced the notion of OKRs for strategic themes. And that does a couple of things. The first thing it does is that our objective can be something that is more memorable. 
you know, we don't have to put the, uh, the goals within the objective as well. So now that we have these key results, that helps us let us know, are we making progress on in increasing the customer engagement in our commu community platform? And if we increase engagement in our, in our community platform, our hypothesis is that we'll increase our recurring revenue and have a stable you know, recurring revenue stream. Well, how do we know that we're getting there? And that's what, where the key results come into play. So one of the, those key results might be reducing membership churn from 20% to 5%, meaning that people aren't uh, quitting and, and, and leaving the community. They're, they're, they're continuing to renew so they stay within the community. We want to improve people's satisfaction with the community. So we want to increase our net promoter score from 25 to 60. Uh, improve non-paid traffic from 1,500 to 5,000 users. These are all proxy measures which are telling us that we are making progress against this particular business objective. And that's really powerful. And typically, we look at updating the strategic themes, the key results from strategic themes on a quarterly basis. And we may adjust those as we go along, as we learn new things. So this is not meant for uh, performance reviews or anything else like that. This is just helping the portfolio know are the things that we're doing, is it actually moving the needle? So we, we won't be able to tell that from an individual feature or even from an individual solution. But we wanna identify the things that help us know whether or not we're accomplishing our objectives. Strategic themes are important because they can be used for several things. Helping us um, craft our current and future state portfolio vision, being used as the decision filter in the portfolio Kanban. Should this epic be in our Kanban? Well, if this large initiative, which is an epic, is in our Kanban system in the funnel, should we review and analyze it? Well, if it's not aligned with any of our strategic themes, why would we want to review and analyze that? We should probably put that one in the trash bin because it's really not helping us achieve our goals. And there are many other areas which you can see here. It also affects the solution program and team backlogs in their decision-making about whether or not the features or capabilities are aligned with the strategic themes as well. Although the tie is a little bit looser down at the release train level than it is at the portfolio. So we want to be able to have a vision and be able to maintain that vision. And one of the tools that we came up with was the notion of a business model canvas for the portfolio. So we took the business model canvas from Alexander Osterwalder and we adapt, adopted it, adapted it rather, for the portfolio. And basically, this is something that's going to help you identify whether or not your portfolio contains the right things. Because as you put, you know, you're going to have a row for each value stream. So you might need 10 rows, you know, in your portfolio. And once you start looking at the solutions that are in that portfolio, the customers that you're, the customer segments that you're serving in that portfolio, and the channels in which you deliver solutions, you all of a sudden a light bulb comes on and you say, you know what, this product doesn't belong in this particular portfolio. It has nothing to do with those other solutions and it really doesn't help us think about our, our group of solutions as a whole. So this canvas, just filling out this very top portion will really help you understand what should be in your portfolio and the value streams are what delivers the value propositions through those solutions to our customers. And I'll show you in a few moments how we're gonna use this and key partners, key activities, key resources, course structure and revenue streams are all related uh, to this business notion of a business model. And, and so I'll, I'll cover some of that in a few minutes. 
So once we can document what our current state of our portfolio looks like today, and again, the top part is the most important part, but it's good to understand, well, how does our portfolio make money? So maybe our revenue is from selling uh, furniture, or maybe our revenue is from our consumer loans. How, what are the cost levers? So again, these don't have to be exact numbers. You know, the cost could be, you know, the number of customers times some, some unit cost of something. It might be storage, it might be, you know, uh, whatever it might be. You wanna identify the unit cost and, and for both unit cost and also the revenue units so that we can understand if, if we're charging $5 a widget, well, how many widgets do we normally have? We normally have 5,000 widgets, so, you know, approximately our revenue is 250 million, but the more widgets we sell, the more revenue you get. Or the more professional services we sell, the more revenue you get. So it's good to understand what drives cost and what drives revenue within the portfolio. And the key partners, activities, and resources are how we accomplish those things. Once we have that current state documented, and you don't have to have everything filled out on the canvas, we can begin defining our, our future state. And we do that by doing a SWOT and TOLS analysis. I'm sure most of you are familiar with a SWOT analysis. The problem with the SWOT analysis by itself is, what the heck do you do with this information once you have it? Well, the TOES, ma ma uh, the TOES strategic option matrix helps us use that information to figure out what should we be doing next. So let's have an example of that. So you put your, your strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats on the outside of this matrix, and then you try to answer questions like, how can your strengths be used to exploit and maximize opportunities? So you'll brainstorm on that. How can your opportunities be used to overcome weaknesses? How can you apply strengths to overcome present and potential threats and so on? And from this information, we'll then begin to identify things that we can change from the current state. So you have your current state canvas, you have your um, SWOT and TOES analysis as inputs. And what you're going to do is you're going to create a number of different future state canvases using divergent thinking. In other words, we're going to brainstorm. We're not going to judge any of those ideas. We just want to come up with as many ideas as we can. One of the things that Alexander Osterwalder teaches in the business model canvas is that we want to see what the impact of a change is of one changes on all the other blocks before we go on to an, another scenario. So let's say that we wanted to break into the Canadian market and we're you know, an American beer company or something, I'm just making this up. Um, what would be the impact if we uh, were selling beer in Canada? Uh, are we gonna have different partners? Are we gonna have um, the different regulations? Are we gonna have to do translation of our software for our French friends in, in, in Ontario. So when you start looking at the canvas and you start looking at the impact it has on each of those blocks of the canvas, you start realizing that whether or not that scenario is feasible or not. And so I was working with a, a company that developed standardized tests for college, college entrance. And the whole college entrance exams are kind of fading out. More and more colleges and universities are phasing out the use of those exams. And so they're figuring out what to do next. And I was working with them on their strategy and they had an idea. And as we were going through the different scenarios with different ideas, we realized that some of those ideas just weren't feasible. And the good part is that we identified them through the canvas, that those weren't feasible ideas, and so that we can focus on ideas which were much more actionable now. And when your core business is at threat, you know, you can't be spending years and years 
trying to change your whole business. You have to, you have to use what you have already to do that. And so we come up with these different scenarios and then we use convergent thinking where we're going to then agree upon what is the best scenario for us to go future. The future state could be a combination of things from the different future state canvases that you came up with. It doesn't just have to be one of the canvas. Once we know what our future state doesn't look like, then we can identify the epics that we need to implement in order to realize that vision. And then we want to express that vision, uh, express that future state as a vision. And that future state vision should be able to answer a number of questions like, how will this vision differentiate us from where we are today to where we want to be tomorrow. If you're not differentiating yourself, that means you're not going to be successful in the market. You just can't do what everyone else is doing and expect that you're going to win. You're probably going to lose. Um, what, is, what is the future context that our solutions will operate? Are they going to be in the cloud? Are they going to be on mobile? desktop, et cetera. Uh, how, how must we evolve our business context to meet this future state? So what do we have to do within our business to achieve this future state? So back to that standardized college test, they, want to go, they wanted to go into education. And from doing standardized tests to go into education, uh, they clearly were not in a position to do that quickly. So you have to think about how we're going to get there. So that's why you want to express this as a vision. And then you want to be able to, to, for people to understand that vision. And one of the things that Dan and Chip Heath say, the authors of, of the book Switch, is to articulate the vision as like a postcard from, a, from the future. On the front of the postcard is this beautiful place that you want to go to. And on the back is some brief information on it. And what you want your vision to be brief and memorable so people understand it. And we want it to be motivational so that people come along with us on that journey. So now let's talk about lean budgets. So we don't want to fund projects anymore because that keeps us in a project model. We want to fund the long lived value streams and then, and then the arts that live within those value streams. So we want to go from funding projects to funding value streams. So we can give, say, $20 million to this value stream, and we also have the guardrails along with it to make sure that they're spending their money wisely and that we're staying in alignment with the portfolio. So we have four different types of guardrails. One is guiding investments by horizon so that we are not uh, over investing in the present and starving the future or are we over investing in the future and starving the present that's what the investment horizons do we have capacity allocation let's make sure that we are spending our investments on maintaining our solutions paying down technical debt and that we have enough new features that we're creating and enough new solutions that we're creating so that as solutions age, we can have new solutions, which then replace those older solutions. We want to make sure that large, impact, large things which impact the entire portfolio are approved. And we want to make sure that our business owners who will be involved in the portfolio are also involved with the agile release trains so that they can help us stay in alignment when, say, we're prioritizing features, and, and other work in which a particular agile release train does. So this is an example of the investment horizons and the portfolio sets approximately what percentage of the capacity will go to each of these investment horizons, like horizon three, which is your incubating new ideas or valuing ideas. Horizon two is where those new ideas that are promising where we're choosing to invest more in that because we're getting good progress against our, um, our leading indicators. Horizon one is where all of our solutions 
that are basically the cash cows. They are the things that fund our organization. And they also fund the new solutions that we incubate in Horizon 3. Now, yeah. I want to step Richard, up I had a question in the previous slide, if you don't mind, sir, just for like quick, quick question. Sure. On the, on the left hand side, it says that the LPM identifies the percentage of the portfolio budget to be invested. And the bottom value stream says the percentage invested in each horizon for value stream may not match the overall portfolio. What, what is the difference? It's a, just a little uh, thought on that. Sure. So the portfolio sets out the guidelines of what overall the portfolio should be doing. So in maybe that you have a, a value stream uh, or a solution within your value stream that you, that you develop and create, and it's been around for a while, and it's in horizon one, and perhaps it doesn't require a lot of investment in horizon one, you're going to put more investment in horizon three. And you may have another value stream, which is the opposite. You need to get more solutions into horizon one. And so your, your investments might be different in each of the value streams. The focus of each value stream may be different, but as a whole, our investments, where we're investing our money in the different horizons is equal to the sum of, of, of the portfolio. So it's a guideline. It's not necessarily a hard and fast rule, but overall, when we look at the sum of the value streams in our investments, we wanted to use the, this guide from the portfolio level. Thank you, sir. Sure. I have a question, if you don't mind. Sure. So it's about the team. So you said that uh, we don't invest anymore in projects, but in value streams. So what are you doing with the teams? Are you doing temporary teams or are you building a team that would uh, go um, uh, bring the value from uh, from one from not stage so from uh, from from uh, conception to conclusion yes. so in safe since we fund value streams and within each value stream there are agile release streams and an art is a team of agile teams and the people in the art stay together for long periods of time so we're not constantly funding a project. It's when it's done, the people disband from the project and move on. And then we form a new project team, disband, and we go through that process all over again. Funding the people, you know, for a particular solution allows us to keep people together for a long period of time. As long as that solution exists, we'll need that agile release chain to continue developing and maintaining that solution. So hopefully that's answered your question. If not, we can, I can get to end because that's a kind of a deep question. Thank you. Sure. Uh, most organizations, there's much more work than we can possibly ever do. And I'm sure you, each of you run into things where you're working on a particular project and all of a sudden the executives push more work down to the, to the teams and then they're completely overloaded. Should we be working on the other project that we were already working on or should we be working on this new project? We clearly can't do everything. And there's nothing that's really controlling this intake and nothing controlling us from starting too much work and not finishing too much work. So the lean mantra is stop starting and start finishing. And that's why we use a Kanban system at the portfolio level to make sure that the work is pulled from the portfolio instead of being pushed to the agile release trains. So we use a Kanban system, and this is an example of the states that you might start out with in the portfolio. And these two numbers at the top of these columns are where we're applying WIP limits, work in process limits. And so what this does, if there are three items in the reviewing state. You can't pull another item from the funnel into reviewing until you pull an item from reviewing into analyzing. We, we, we're, it's preventing from too much work being started and not enough work being finished. And this is important not only at the portfolio level, 
but for agile lease trains and individual teams as well. This also helps us reason about and analyze these large initiatives in a way that helps us get them done faster. We'll also identify each large initiative. We're just not gonna place a big bet and put you know, $2 million on this particular epic because we don't even know whether that's the functionality that the market wants or whether it'll move the needle in terms of our strategic themes. So we'll build an MVP, and this is a, um, the smallest possible product that we can introduce in the marketplace and get fast feedback about that. That's safe definition. There's a hundred definitions of, of what an MVP is. It's gotten really convoluted, but that's our definition. And if we just invest in the MVP, it's an experiment. And we can do many experiments uh, during implementing to identify what will actually move the needle. We can even do some experiments in analyzing, but those would be different types of MVPs. So in analyzing, you could throw up a, an explainer video and see if you get really great feedback on that. In analyzing, you could put up uh, a page about a new product or service and see if there's interest. Will people download or request downloading an app uh, if it's put out there before you actually even build it? So there's many techniques in the lean startup uh, build, measure, learn cycle. So using the MVPs is gonna help make sure that we just don't place you know, a $2 million, $5 million, $10 million bet at the casino and hope it works out because we know that most of our new ideas don't work out. So let's make small investments and get the information we need to get the learning to see what we should make, be making more investments in something. That's what the main purpose of the portfolio Kanban is. So I'm gonna zoom up into what this, each of these states mean. In the funnel, all big ideas are welcome. And when something goes into the funnel, you wanna make sure, is that really an epic? We don't want all of the work in the portfolio to come into the portfolio Kanban. We don't want to see features. We don't want to see stories in the portfolio Kanban because executives and senior leaders are not concerned with features and stories. That's the job of the teams. But large investments, which cross multiple value streams and products, that is a portfolio concern. So we wanna make, that's the, what we're gonna do in funnel in review, is the epic aligned with a the strategic theme? Is this a good idea? If we don't think it's a good idea, let's kill it right away. Whereas many organizations, every new project idea that comes in, they're gonna analyze that project idea. That doesn't make sense. Why spend time analyzing something that is really not gonna move the needle or it just doesn't make sense. Analyzing is where we're really get a, a group of people together to analyze the epic and then fill out a lean business case, which will then be reviewed and approved by the LPM team. And then we will, as part of the analyzing, we'll also define the MVP. And then when we go, when something has been approved by LPM, when there's capacity on one or more trains to begin working on it, we can begin working on an on a MVP and it will go through the build, measure, learn, startup cycle. If the benefit hypothesis has been proven, we'll persevere. If it's, not pr if it's not proven, we'll either pivot to something else or we'll stop working on that epic. So it really makes sure that we're spending our money wisely and we're not over investing in something that nobody wants. This is a deep drill down on the uh, lean startup cycle. So I'm not gonna spend much time here, we will provide you with a PDF of the slides so you can look through them a bit more. And you can read this on the, on the framework site. But I just wanted to show you what this Lean Startup Cycle looked like. Um, you know what, I think you know, maybe it's actually worthwhile to spend time on the Lean Startup Cycle and then maybe less time on the, on the operations and Lean Governance. So once we have uh, a Lean Business case, we're gonna define what the MVP is. We're then gonna build and evaluate the MVP. If the hypothesis is proven, then the trains will continue working on that epic. If it's not proven, we may come up with a new hypothesis and pivot. 
So you may not know this, but as an example, YouTube actually started out as a dating site. And you would upload your video and people would watch it and see if they wanted to go out with you. Well, what they found out was that people didn't value the dating aspect of, of YouTube. And I forgot what was, what was called back then. Uh, what they valued was the ability to upload videos. So they did a, a, a pivot, a, a customer a feature pivot, where they decided, well, we're gonna, what we've built is good, but instead of having a dating site, we're gonna just focus on people uploading and sharing videos. That's an example of a pivot. So pivots often are a good outcome because if they would have continued working on that dating site, they probably wouldn't be profitable. They probably wouldn't have been purchased with, by, by Google, you know. Um, they're highly successful, I mean, because of that pivot decision they made. We may find that our benefit hypothesis tells us we should stop. This doesn't make sense. Perhaps the idea nobody wants, perhaps we can't execute on it. And an epic is considered done when the portfolio, the LPM team decides that we no longer need governance on this. So once the initial uh, epic has been implemented, you may not need, the portfolio may not need to pay attention to the epic so closely. The, the teams working in a decentralized fashion may feel that they uh, they've, they've got it. We don't need that level of oversight because in SAFE, we really emphasize decentralized decision making and decentralized execution. I want to be mindful of our time box. So, how much more time do we have left? So, it's booked until 7 30, so we still have time if you want to go ahead. Okay, good. And then uh, remind me to stop at 7 15, so make sure we have a good enough time for questions. Yes. So I won't go as deep as in the next two sections, Agile Portfolio Operations and Lean Governance. Agile Portfolio Operations, you'll notice that people involved in that is a different group of people. Typically, it's the Agile PMO or Lean Agile Center of Excellence would be involved in this. And what they do is they help coordinate work across the value streams and they help share good program execution patterns across the portfolio. And they also help foster operational excellence. Now, there's two, two things that the portfolio must really pay attention to. One is the strategy and implementing that strategy. But in being operational excellent, excellent is not a strategy, but it's important. The more efficient and effective we can become means that we can lower the price of our goods and services or increase the profit margins because we can do things at a lower cost. So it, that's why it has the attention of LPM because it has an impact on profit and revenue. What you're seeing on the screen here is the kinds of things that we need to do when we're coordinating work across different value streams. And sometimes different value streams are working towards a common solution set. So maybe the bottom value stream is creating Microsoft Word, where the top value stream is working on Microsoft Excel. But they both contribute to the solution on the right, which is Microsoft Office. So we will need to coordinate work against those two products because they contribute to a common solution. So sometimes we have coordination across trains, sometimes we have coordination across value streams. And we used a lot of the same things at the value stream level for coordination that we use for agile release trains. And that's what you're seeing here. And on, on the left are some additional coordination roles such as enterprise architects, a solution portfolio management team, which is kind of think of your director of product management, those type of senior leaders, and your PMO. But in this case, we want to transform that PMO to an agile PMO. If you don't have a PMO, you may not need a PMO. Maybe just a lean agile center of excellence 
is, is enough. And you'll see how we have each of the value streams work on the same schedule or same cadence. So what does the PMO do? Well, they work with the Lean Agile Center, Center of Excellence to identify which trains are really doing well, which are executing well, they're getting successful business results. Well, can any of the learnings from there be shared with other agile release trains? The APMO will also help with, and LACE will help with fostering more agile contracts. We all know that if our contracts are written in such a way, they're gonna cause waterfall behavior. We wanna have those lean budgets. And we also want to have measurements, which is the next part, and looking uh, in our operational excellence, that we're using metrics and measures uh, for improvement that actually will cause the right behaviors. You know, when you have metrics, it's always a double-edged sword. Metrics can lead you to the wrong things. So they need to foster the right metrics that are objective measures of working solutions and they'll help communicate the business need of safe, and they'll help, you know, different agile release trains, which are starting up, implement the practices of safe. They'll provide coaching and training to agile release trains and other stakeholders. And again, they'll establish those objective measures. If you're still, if you're using the old measures of traditional project management with safe or any agile method, in matter of fact, you're gonna get the old results. So if you're still using percent complete, that doesn't tell you if you're really making any progress. That just tells you that you've, you've completed a certain number of activities. But if you look at, well, how many features have we completed? You know, what are the outcomes that we're getting from the features? Then we're measuring real progress. And lean governance is the last part of the triangle in lean portfolio management. In here, we want to be able to um, determine, we're going to take our annual budget and we're going to look at changing it, say, every two PIs or approximately every six months and to shifting the funding from one value stream to another so that the annual budget is still the same. We usually can't change the, the whole pie, but we can determine how the pie is given to each of the different value streams. So after two PIs, we may decide that the Excel value stream needs more money than the Word value stream. So we can shift our funding and we have a process for doing that called participatory budgeting. We're also gonna be measuring the performance of the portfolio itself, as well as compliance. And compliance is an important area too. It may not be the most exciting area, unless you're the executive who might get fired or go to jail if you're not in compliance. So that's why it's at the portfolio level. And we need to have a consistent approach across the portfolio for compliance. Every team, every agile release train can have a different approach for compliance because it would be impossible to manage. So compliance is one of those areas in which we need to really globally optimize across the portfolio and the entire enterprise. And notice that the stakeholders or people involved in that collaboration are a bit different. You have enterprise architects, you have business owners, and you have the agile PMO and LACE. And again, these are minimum roles. We expect that you'll have more roles than what we're just putting out here. And they'll have different titles, of course. So we all know that the problems with annual planning. We're saying what our budget should be up front, and then we can't shift our funding. We've committed that funding to projects or other or some initiatives. But what if we were to replan, you know, like we do in, in SAFE, and we do that quarterly for the most part, and then we look at adjusting budgets every two PI. So if we don't change budgets here at, after the first PI. We'll, change, we'll look at changing budgets after the second PI and we'll use something called participatory budgeting to help us figure out as a portfolio, what are the most important things to the portfolio as a whole? So we don't want the system becoming selfish. 
We don't want value streams hogging the money for their particular value stream when there might be other more important things within, within the portfolio that we should be working on. But we want to collaborate on that. We want to agree on that. And most of the times when people have the facts, they'll do the right things. So this is a little bit of information about persuade budgeting. And the problem that this solves is that you have more good ideas than you can possibly implement. And imagine that, that each table has people from different value streams. You may have a senior leader at one table. And at the same table, you may have a product manager. Uh, you may have a, a product owner at that table. And as you get more advanced, you may actually have uh, all the teams together. And again, this is showing you in face-to-face. Remember those days? Uh, and instead, we can also do the same thing remotely. And we actually have a tool uh, that Safe now provides for free when you become a member of, um, when you take a course, you become a member of our platform. Uh, so we will, what we'll do is we'll vote on the initiatives that we have identified in the portfolio Kanban and people will vote on those initiatives and they'll debate those initiatives and see where they want to put the money. No one person has enough money to fund everything. So the people at the table have to collaborate on what should be funded. And that helps socialize what we're trying to accomplish. So we get alignment as well as we hear from, we get the wisdom of the crowd from people in the portfolio. And that helps us select the, the most, the best ideas by doing that. And just like planning poker, the value of planning poker is in the conversations that you have. It's not what number that you picked out, oh, well, it's a four or a three. It's getting understanding of the scope that you're gonna be working on. Well, it's similar here. The valuable part of this is understanding what are the things that most people think are the most important? And we get the wisdom of the crowd. So once we have done spray budgeting, and you can read, our, we have an article on our website about that. And it's a fun game, Ashley. We're then ready to adjust budgets. We'll use the information from, I'll just call it PB, because perspiratory budgeting is a big phrase. So we'll use the information from PB to determine do we need to change the amount of people that we have in each of the value streams in order to accomplish our goals? And so we may move people from one value stream to another. We may hire external people with certain skills to uh, increase the budget of a certain value stream. Uh, if you are not using consultants, this becomes harder and you don't want to just hire and fire people all the time. To me, that's not a very lean and agile way of working. So this is showing that this first value stream had $10 million. And after we did the PB, we realized that the initiative that they're trying to accomplish, they actually need $3 million more. We realized that this $18 million that we had in, in this value stream is not as critical. So therefore we can shift spending from one value stream to another. Now notice that the total portfolio budget is the same. It was $28 million before, it's still $28 million now, except we've changed the, the amount of capacity that we have on each of these value streams. So that takes an annual budgeting process and it makes it much more agile and dynamic. And we don't commit to uh, all these initiatives up front the year before. When we evaluate progress towards meeting our portfolio objectives, we want to have objective measures. And what you're seeing here are the first column was showing the goals. So if we want to increase employee engagement, how do we do that? Well, we can use employee surveys. We can get information from Agile People Operations or Agile HR. And more engaged employees usually results in better business outcomes. In fact, the Society of Human Resources says that highly engaged employees, their companies perform 65% better 
than those who are entirely engaged. And notice that at the top, I've got employee engagement and customer satisfaction at the top. If your employees aren't happy, then your customers are not gonna be happy. You need happy employees to have happy customers. So we must take care of our employees first, and then we can properly take care of our customers. And so customer satisfaction is the next thing. Partners, you know, we can, we can argue that they're at the same level as employee engagement because they're in effect, they're supplementing our people resources. And then we have things like self-assessments. Are we adopting safe in a way that is actually producing the results that we need? So you can take a bunch of assessments that we have, and we also provide suggestions when you're low scores in different areas of the assessment, what are the kinds of things that you can do? And we have what's called a GROWS database, which you can pick, you can, you can read these articles, you can watch these videos, you can go into a community platform and take an online course. So we have a, a lot of things that will help you progress. And if you haven't been in our community platform for a while, please log in and check it out because it's come a really long way from where it was before. You'll find a lot of great information you know, and short learning vignettes, such as videos and other e-learning modules that you can, uh, you can do. So most of these metrics after that are based upon do we have a working solution? Do we have working software? Are we getting good feedback? Are we, move, are we moving the needle on our strategic themes? Are we achieving the key results that we thought we had, that we thought we were going to achieve? So those are important metrics. We wanna look at our predictability, extremely important metric. So we'll, we, we do that you know, during PI planning, We'll have actual, we'll have planned business value. And at the end of the PI, we'll measure our actual uh, business value using some proxy measures as well. The more predictability that the business has, the better that they can plan and succeed. Time to market is critical today. You know, we all know the effect of digital disruption. We know how fast companies are moving and how fast new products enter the marketplace and how fast that our competition can copy us. You know, if you have a good process, today it seems that other companies can copy that process pretty quickly. They can copy your, um, your products pretty quickly. So that's why that differentiating aspect of the product and the portfolio is so important. You want things that are hard to imitate. So in the case of Ikea, they have stores in 160 countries around the world. It's gonna be very difficult to you know, do the same thing that Ikea did and have stores all over the place and have distribution channels all over the place. It's gonna be hard for you to design furniture that can be put together and shipped in flat boxes. So you wanna kinda of create a strategy that allows you to differentiate and be hard to imitate. And that's why it's so important to have the predictability and to see that we're making progress on our strategic themes. And quality is always important because if you don't have good quality, you can't scale crappy, crappy code, you can't scale crappy anything. Everything needs to be of high quality for us to move and continue to move the speed. So one of the things that we wanna do in terms of moving with speed and, we, we, and safety, we need to be sure that we're complying with regulations, industry standards, and we, want, we don't want to wait to the very end to do that. And I see many agile teams where compliance is an afterthought. It's something that you check at the very end. And we all know what happens when we leave things for the very end. Things blow up. Well, we have a lot of rework at the end. Instead of having compliance at the very end, at the top like this waterfall process, every single iteration, we want to be testing for compliance. And even better, if we create our compliance test each and every iteration, and if we're running our compliance test each and every iteration, 
so that we're not finding out those compliance issues at the very end of an iteration or at the very end of a, of a program increment. So that's what this is about. And we have a number of quality practices of compliance practices that allows you to do this incrementally. So if you're interested in LPM, what are some of the next steps that you can do? Well, if you're an SPC, I highly recommend taking the Lean Portfolio Management course. Uh, and we offer, we offer the course both publicly and we offer the course as a private course. Is there a question? Okay, must have heard feedback. So if you, as an SPC, if you go to a public course, then you can hear what everything, what's going on with other companies who are trying to implement LPM as well. And then you can bring back your learning from the class and then tailor an internal class to your particular company. You'll also understand the preparation that you'll need to do to conduct the class in your own organization. So very important that you do both. And also I highly recommend getting an experienced SBC to help you adopt lean portfolio management because there's, as you can see, there's a lot of nuance to it. And there's a lot of things that a lot of people haven't had experience with, you know, strategy. You know, most of us haven't had experience of developing strategy and implementing strategy and doing all that measurement that we were talking about. The other thing that we have is part of that uh, class. So there's a two day uh, class and there's a one day workshop if you teach the course in a, in a private setting. And here we're gonna we're gonna practice doing a, a bunch of things in the uh, on the adoption roadmap. So we now have an adoption roadmap for LPM. It's similar in concept to the safe implementation roadmap, but it's not as linear as what's in the safe implementation roadmap. That's why it's not visualized in that way. And what you'll do in this workshop is you'll practice doing things like creating strategic themes, you know, creating a portfolio canvas and the, creating the LPM team and so on. And out of this class, you'll have some starting points as well as being able to build a plan to adopt LPM in your organization. And it typically can take from several months to even several years until it's fully adopted. And this really helps you getting started quickly and focusing on things that you can do right away to to make an impact, such as getting that LPM established, making all work visible through the portfolio Kanban, scheduling the three LPM events, which are um, portfolio sync, the strategic portfolio review, and participatory budgeting. So having the cadence of those things scheduled is very important. Do those three things and you'll have a really good start on LPM. Now we're also providing uh, in our community platform, we'll shortly be releasing what we call the LPM experience. And it will be a place within the community platform that you can read different articles, play different videos. For example, the what is strategy video is available from our community platform. You can watch a video about how to implement the portfolio Kanban. Uh, you can watch a video about strategic themes and so on. So we're gonna continue building out the content for this because we, in a community, because we realize that this takes a lot of coaching, mentoring and reinforcement of the concepts. And I'm gonna do a shameless plug if you don't mind for my book, which I released uh, in June and it's safe to still 5.0. And it's available both in paperback and on Kindle um, stores and in, it's available in most bookstores. And just to show you, this is the size of Safe Distilled. Our CEO gave me the challenge of making a thin book. And he told me if I could make my book as thin as Zone to Win, he would be very happy. Well, my book is actually thinner than Zone to Win. And this was my very first distilled book. And you can see how much thicker it is. So this is a great resource for lean portfolio management or 
really anything in your learning journey. And in fact, uh, Richard, just to mention, yes, it's a great book. You can see me displaying mine. Pardon me? I said it's a great book. You can see okay. me displaying mine. I actually have two copies. <laughs> Excellent. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And just so you know, neither Scaled Agile or I received any royalties for this. Wow. And we are, we, you know, we allowed the publisher to get all the money for this to make the cost of the books uh, uh, cheaper and to start translating the book. So it's a shameless plug, but it's for good, good purpose. Um, and so I guess we have now have time for questions. And I think yeah. we have about. Yeah, I have one question, Richard, actually. So uh, can you just give a little uh, explanation on the normalized cost? Sure. So let me show the framework is the best way to do that. So you know how we do WSJF? We use proxy numbers, Fibonacci numbers, for WSJF, right? For, for features and for epics. Well, what we've recently introduced, sorry, I'm going to the wrong website. That's feature version of safe, very minor feature version. And so now what we're saying is you can use actual or estimated cost for calculating WSJF. So I'm gonna go into the WSJF article. And what you'll see here is that instead of using Fibonacci numbers for the duration as a proxy for duration, we can use cost as a proxy for duration. However, in order to have, in order to make the math work, we have to normalize the cost. So let's say we have these five different epics and they all have these different costs. In order to normalize that, what you do is you look at the lowest cost epic and you make that a one. The second lowest cost epic is epic number seven. It costs $1.5 million, which is three times as big as Epic number six. Epic number eight is 11.2 times larger than epic six. So you're able to normalize the numbers and then use these numbers as the denominator for WSJF. And since we have estimated the cost of the epics while creating the lean business case, we don't have to use a Fibonacci number for duration, which most executives will, will scratch their head and say, what the heck is this? It just makes it simpler to do the WSJF. And cost makes a good, pro a good proxy for duration because normally things that cost more um, take longer period of time. And there are some caveats that using cost as a proxy for duration doesn't always work out. So you have to have to be mindful of that because if you have a lot of hardware cost, well, that necessarily isn't going to take more time, uh, even though it's going to take more money. Does that give you a good explanation? Uh, yeah, definitely. Thank you. And again, Thank you can read more in the WSJF article. I think most of uh, like Richard have a concise version of LPM class and everything he mentioned is actually spread out in the LPM class. We have an exercise for parse query budget. So this is, would be great actually. If, if you're interested in exploring more, that's a great um, course to attend. Yep, and, and we'll shortly have some online stuff that you can take for free. If you're an SPC, you can always buy one license of the course and uh, take the enablement and become familiar with, uh, with the course. So that's another thing that you can do. Um, I think we probably have time for just one more question and I want to be respectful of the time box here and then I can stay afterwards for people who want to stay longer. Uh, hey Richard, my name is Paul Shaker. I'm an SPC. Um, I, um, I've been perusing around the Collaborate tool that has just been released. <clears throat> I'm going to start using that in the very near future. Great. Um, and I'm, I'm doing an LPM uh, 
participatory uh, budget type of um, mock-up at this point just to show leadership how we can utilize it and I'm going to go ahead and and use the one that's in the collaborate tool with the template and so on. Are any recommendations in regards to using that? Because it, it looks like it's a pretty cool tool, uh, but I haven't, I haven't gone through it completely with a group of people, but I, uh, the collaborate tool I think is a fantastic tool. And um, I, I, I really like what you're, what's out there right now. I just wanted to know if you had any hints. Yes, so the, Prospect budgeting portion of Collaborate is probably the most immature. And so I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's worthwhile experimenting with, but it's, it's, it's not as mature as other parts of Safe Collaborate. And we're going to be uh, working on the next two PIs, we're going to be working on uh, making that work even better. Uh, and in the, in the LPM Execution Toolkit, there is a slide deck that shows you how to set up uh, prosperity budgeting step by step. And um, the toolkit, uh, not via Collaborate, but just in the uh, just in the toolkit. Yeah, in the, in the toolkit, there's a slide deck in there that will tell you how to set it up, how to set up PB in in in, the, in Collaborate, and there's also a spreadsheet that you can import into Google Sheets, and then okay. do prosperity budgeting in Google Sheets. Right. Which I found right now to be a little bit more successful than Collaborate because it's immature. Okay. All right. That portion of the tool. Okay. But you're definitely going to be working on it. We'll rapidly improve it. And All we, right. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the, the classroom now in, in Safe Collaborate, which has been greatly improved. Oh, yes. I did take a look at it. It, it, it looks really, it looks pretty slick. Yes. Okay, cool. And it makes it really easy to do and fun to teach courses remotely. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. It's, it's gonna be a very useful all around tool for, for many things. I, I mean, I work for an organization with about 40,000 strong. So, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna to start to move forward and a lot of things. So this is gonna be very helpful, especially and, in these conditions. And which small company do you work for, if you don't mind my asking? Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, great. And perhaps, you know, we can touch base uh, I'll put my email address in here. So if you guys have other questions, but I'm also looking for some customers who would like to experiment with spray budget because the process is, the process is new to the commercial world. Um, and the process is new to, um, it, it's, it's been used in, 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 in city government, but it's not, it's not been applied as much to, businesses, but we're, we're getting a lot of success with, with the companies who are beginning to use it. Great. Okay, so we'll end here. And um, I guess we can stop the recording. And if anyone wants to stay behind for a little bit more, I can answer some more in depth questions. So you can stay on you can drop off, you know, use the law of two feet, I won't be insulted. Yes. Thanks, Richard. Sure. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. So uh, that's our time box. However, Richard is kind enough to to actually stay here if you have question, if you want to discuss something. Um, he's more than happy to to share his time. And thank you, Richard, for that extra time. Sure, my pleasure. Thank, thank you, Richard. Richard. It was really good. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. That's <clears throat> Hey, Richard, one more question just um, for the technology business management and how we can uh, connect in the Scale Agile framework, the TBM. Yes. So if you're not familiar with TBM, there's an organization called tbmcouncil.org that will provide you more information on it. And what technology business management allows you to do, it kind of fills in something that SAFE doesn't have, and which is tracking cost other than labor cost. So TBM mm -hmm. will track um, how much are we spending on different IT towers or silos? How much is on end user computing? How much is in uh, software development? How much is in our network money where we're spending on networking, on our hardware, et cetera. And that helps you understand the total cost of ownership of your applications and also understanding what are your run the business costs 
for maintaining all these applications and so that you can understand the trade-offs between cost and value. And it also will help you identify um, how can we move money from run the business to grow the business? You know, we always want to make that shift so that we're spending more money on, on running, on growing versus running. And there's a, on this same website, there is an advanced topic article that I wrote on TBM. So if you go to resources, advanced topics, and then there's this index here, and you'll see the white paper for TBM. And I'm just gonna do a search with control F. Yeah, it's a, you have to write technology, I think. Yeah, it's probably just technology. Yep, here it is. Oh, no, not that one. Uh, there it is, it's under T. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> So I just should use the index. So if you click on this, you'll get a white paper and it explains how you can use TBM and SAFE together. And if you're in the government space, uh, at least in the US, the US government and other governments as well are starting to mandate the use of TBM so that you can understand the cost of your technology spending and other areas in which you can reduce that spending, for example, moving to the cloud, uh, using microservices, you know, the whole gamut. So that's what TBM is, is all about. Absolutely, thank you. You're welcome, and I'll, and I'll put the link in the chat here. Sure, I read already this one just. Okay. And are you using TBM? Uh, I'm SPC. Pardon? Yeah, I'm also at PC actually. Okay. I think we have a question from Hannah. Hannah, do you wanna share your question? Yeah, so uh, um, it just uh, was like uh, going through different uh, safe certifications and uh, um, I, what I love about it is just because it's a holistic view and the holistic understanding of uh, different, um, different topics. And uh, because I am uh, a scrum master, I'm, uh, I was like looking at things that uh, will get me to the next level. And I was just wondering what is the difference between a scrum master from scrum alliance and a safe scrum master, so. Right, so both, you know, in both roles, you, you know, we use scrum. Uh, so our agile release trains, and let me go to the homepage of the Scout Agile Framework, teams can use uh, Scrum, they can use Kanban, and they can use XP. In fact, most teams on an Agile release train use all three. They use Scrumban, and they also use XP quality practices. So a Scrum Master uh, from, the, let's say, Scrum Alliance typically is only working with one or two teams tops. In an Agile release train, there might be five to 12 teams. So a scrum master, uh, a safe scrum master needs to know all the things that, they, that they've learned in scrum, plus they also need to understand Kanban, and they also need to understand how do you collaborate with five teams or 10 teams or 12 teams? How do we plan as a team of agile teams? So we have something called PI planning, and you can click on that icon and it will bring you to an article about that particular practice. So those are the main differences because we, 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 don't, we don't limit our Agile teams to just Scrum. They typically use uh, Scrum XP. They also use design thinking and customer centricity. We also, Scrum masters learn about DevOps. They learn about built-in quality practices, which are mainly uh, the XP practices plus other practices for like hardware development and, and the like. Uh, we, you learn the core values of SAFE. We have four core values. You'll learn the SAFE principles. And these principles are lean agile principles. You know, taking an economic view all the way down to organizing around value. Um, so these are great principles and they're universal. So if you're just using Scrum, these principles all apply. 
And that's the beauty of principles is that they're universal in nature. So, so you, Hanna, you just learn more. Go ahead. So Hanna, Hanna it's actually uh, the same. There's no difference. In SAFE, you get extra, which is the Kanban concept, which is, as Richard mentioned, on top, you're going to have this layer of how this Scrum Master will act in an enterprise kind and how the connection with the Agile release train work. So you get almost the same material. I'm certified on both. Um, and you get some extra about uh, that. So you... It's a different certification, buddy, but that's how I look at it. So do I have to go like into the uh, first one foundation and then go into... Uh, mm, like no, not necessarily. Yeah, so, so you, can take, you can take a safe Scrum Masterclass or you know, a, a good starting point for, for learning safe is taking the um, leading safe course. It's a two day course. And that gives you a good understanding of the entire framework. So my recommendation would be take leading safe first and then take safe scrum master. If you're limited on budget, then, you know, beginning with safe scrum master, you know, you'll still be okay. And you can always go to our resources and you can read the safe white paper or you can read the safe distilled book to give you an overall understanding so that when you take the safe scrum master class, you won't be going in there cold. So that's the, that's the kind of a couple of paths that you can take. Oh, thank you very much for the advice. Sure. Let's see. Um, implementing LPM could take months or years. So um, after a few months, and again, not the entire thing, you know, you can get a lot of the benefits very quickly. Like when you, when you adopt SAFE, you know, it's going to take you years before you really get great at, at Agile, which, which is what SAFE is. SAFE is Agile and Lean together. Um, and as soon as you, you launch your first training, you do your first PI planning, you're already getting benefits. Well, similar to LPM, if you formed your LPM team, if you've identified your strategic themes and you make all the work visible through your portfolio Kanban, then you can get value just after a few months. Now, you'll be surprised. You know, I'm working with a number of clients now and just getting agreement on what's in our portfolio can take a lot of uh, sessions, work sessions to get there. It could take a lot of sessions to agree on strategic themes. Uh, even what is an epic and where our epics are in the Kanban. So you'd be surprised that where people have things in the Kanban, they'll have things in implementing which hasn't even been approved by the LPM team. So that's why it takes a while to, to fully implement lean portfolio management in an organization. So after a few months, you know, you'll definitely get the benefit of the visibility as you implement things like the lean startup cycle. You know, you'll then have the benefit of not over investing in a solution that maybe nobody wants. Uh, as you get into the portfolio canvas and create a vision for the portfolio, you'll start getting the benefit of, uh, of having strategy and execution alignment. So each thing that you do within the roadmap will get you uh, more and more benefit. And you can incrementally implement LPM just like you do anything else in the framework. And of course, the framework is meant to be adapted. So you can do that as well. And the one day getting started workshop, that's part of the two day private course, uh, will help you build that implementation roadmap. And you can, working with an experienced SBC who's done this before, you can figure out what are the things that are gonna move the needle for us uh, when implementing LBM the most. Thank you, Richard. Sure. Um, let's see, what do I think is in the hat to waterfall? I think that waterfall is going to be like an old movie actor. They just fade away after a time. And it's not, waterfall isn't going away permanently. Uh, it's going to take a while to phase it out. It's been 20 years since the Agile Manifesto was written. And we all know that we have parts of our organization which are Agile, but not everything has moved that way. But I think over time, 
we won't even call it leaner, leaner agile. It'll just be, this is the way that we do work. And there are some, there are some things which Waterfall does a really good job with. So we shouldn't throw that you know, under the bus. And project managers have a lot of great skills. So let's move them into new roles, such as you know, release train engineer, or scrum masters, or product managers, or maybe they were a coder before, or they can go back to coding. So the discipline of project management is, is still important, but we do things much differently today than we did when project management was in, invented 40 or 50 years ago. The world is much different than it was back 50 years ago. All right, so I think it seems like our questions have slowed down. Uh, Richard. And yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, it's regarding uh, coordination between the teams. So when we are working in a safe, uh, there will be multiple teams uh, working on Scrum and Kanban. So they work in on a different criteria, like Scrum as events and Kanban work on WIP and uh, swim lanes. So how they usually coordinate? Uh, what because they ultimately they have to meet the PI uh, after a certain period. So how they coordinate and how like. Uh, uh, I know like there will be scrum of scrum for the two scrum teams when we are uh, doing it in an enterprise level. So how about uh, Kanban uh, coordinate with scrum team? Yes, so um, that's the very simple answer is click on this article team Kanban and, and, and it, it will give you uh, the answers on how Kanban teams coordinate. A little bit longer answer is Kanban teams still need to do, will participate in PI planning. And when you first start using Kanban and SAFE, I recommend using Scrumban because we still have to coordinate our work to do system demos, which is a demo of the work of multiple teams. Uh, we, we probably need to still coordinate uh, iteration planning. And even though iteration planning isn't part of Kanban, yep. it's probably a good idea to do it first until you really understand uh, how to do Kanban and use the different ways of coordinating. But for example, let's say that you're a mature Kanban team and we're doing PI planning. You're probably not using story points in Kanban. It's just a continuous flow process. Yep. So when you're doing planning, you just might, okay, last PI, uh, our team was able to do two features. And so we think that this PI, we could probably do these two features plus you know, do this refactoring and pay down this technical debt. So you'll just get your information for PI planning in a, in a slightly different way. Um, you can, doesn't mean that you can't still use story points and Scrumbon, I, I think is a great method where you're using the best of both Scrum and Kanban. And most of our Agile teams start off with a combination of Scrum and Kanban. And for example, when you have like maintenance, if you have maintenance teams or the system team, where the arrival of work is very uneven, then you can probably work in a pure Kanban way. In fact, system teams using Kanban is, is, is a thing that I highly recommend. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. That, yeah, with that, I think uh, we gonna wrap up. Thanks everyone who attended today and have a good night.